On this exciting episode of the Perry Pod, we meet a skirt chasing degenerate who also happens to be a water skier, and yet someone is both angry and mournful when our wolf in a speedo comes down with a little case of murder. I guess there's no accounting for taste. The case of the angry mourner. to the seventh episode of the Perry Pod. I'm your humble host, Jonathan Searcy, and my purpose here is pretty simple. Provide an audio companion to the greatest legal drama in television history, Perry Mason. The goal is to do a pod for every episode of the television series and, if time permits, to cover some of those made-for-TV movies, too. I'll be working through the series in the order in which the episodes were aired. Each week, I'll give a brief refresher on the plot, and if the episode was based on a novel, I'll compare the book with its television adaptation. Next, I'll list some key pieces of trivia, as well as tackle the episode's main theme. We'll feature a Perry proverb, a moment of wisdom from the man himself, and then we'll finish with a post-case water cooler, where just like Perry, Della, and Paul, we can rehash the ins and outs of the case. But first, to the law library! Each week in the law library, we'll review previous cases and fill in some details we might have missed. This week, we went back to the old IMDB files and found that last week's episode, The Case of the Silent Partner, gave us the first appearance on Perry Mason of many actors and actresses who would reappear in the Perry universe over the course of its nine-season run. For instance, Cyril Delevante, who is Tullock, and Michael Emmett, who portrays Sam Link, each appeared in one more episode. Stepping it up a notch is Peggy Maley, a.k.a. Lola Flory, who appeared in two more episodes. Anne Barton, a.k.a. Mildred Kimber, appeared in three more. Dan Seymour, a.k.a. Harry Marlowe, appeared in six more. And Mark Roberts, a.k.a. the ineffectual milk toast Bob Kimber, gets the brass ring as he appeared in the seven more episodes of the show. This is one of the things I like most about the Perry universe, the sense of familiarity provided by the recurring stock of character actors. And it's always intriguing to see how an actor's past appearances on the show end up haunting their new characters when they reappear. Now, to this week's episode. The Angry Warner begins with a wolfish, but crippled Mark Cushing showing young and naive Carla Adrian, aka a young Barbara Eden, his water skiing exploits. The why the dude showed the video featuring him breaking his ankle is anybody's guess. After the highlight show ends, Cushing is interested in a mm, little extracurricular activity and even wheelchair bound, he's a Me Too incident waiting to happen. Well, you're not planning on leaving, are you? You said that concluded the performance for the evening. Is there a cartoon? Yeah. Later. Right now, it's time for the intermission. Well, would you like me to fix you another drink? No. I don't want any popcorn, either. Mark! Don't fight me, baby. Let me go. Barbara Eden says no, 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 and gives the wolf a little five-finger special to the face. Slap. Next thing we know, we're inside a stranger's house, and the stranger's getting up in the middle of the night, telling his wife he's heard something from the Cushing place. Betsy! Betsy, wake up! Did you hear that? Betsy! Betsy! What? Didn't you hear that? What's the matter with you? How could I hear anything? I was asleep. Sounded like a shot in breaking glass. Well, you must have been having a nightmare. I tell you, I heard a shot. Came from Mark Cushing's place. Did you look? No, it's... A little neighborly snooping reveals that Belle Adrian, the mother of Carla Adrian, is cleaning up inside Cushing's home. 
the call to the police, and we find out that Ding Dong, the wolf, is dead. The nosy neighbor's name, Sam Burris. In a telling side chat with the sheriff, he reveals he's got beef with Cushing over a deal gone wrong. Now, you wouldn't be holding out on me, would you, Sam? Why would I do that? You didn't like Mr. Cushing there, huh? No, I didn't. You know darn well he swindled me, Bert. Now, that was an everyday business deal. Everyday business deal, my foot. As a result, he's anxious to help his good friend, Belle Adrian, and conveniently keeps her name out of his report to the police. Belle? Well, she's more interested in protecting her daughter, Carla, than herself, and thus seeks solace and counsel from the vacationing Perry Mason. We aren't actually involved in this personally, you understand. We? My daughter Carla and myself. But I'm afraid that she may become involved in the notoriety. Now on the case, Perry quickly assembles the troops. The most intriguing thing that Paul digs up in his detective work is the existence of a main squeeze for Cushing, one Marion Keats the titular angry mourner. Marion Keats, five feet seven, blue eyes, 123 pounds, 25 years old. Address, 1107 Rossmore, LA. Sounds more like it. Thanks, Anderson. Perry promptly slaps her with a subpoena, but not before she gives him an earful. What's this? A subpoena for a preliminary hearing. You're ordered to appear tomorrow at 10 a.m. Get out! Get out! Perry's on the road in this one, and rural prosecutor Darwin Hale builds up a pretty good case against Bell. His haymaker comes when he gets testimony from Sam Burris's wife about Bell Adrian's being at the murder scene and all, something that Burris conveniently left out on the stand. Perry is blindsided by his client and his outburst at Bell in a court recess is as angry as we've seen the normally cool, calm, and collected counselor at any point in the show. For some unaccountable reason, Mrs. Adrian, people in trouble foolishly try to escape it by lying to their lawyers. But you're allowing me to go into court without complete knowledge of the facts is inexcusable. This is no time for tears, Mrs. Adrian. Now tell me, did you... Look at me. Did you kill Mark Cushing? Did you? Eventually, Perry gets the angry mourner on the stand, and in spite of the protests of Marion Keats's attorney, Perry unearths some crucial evidence. Mason's throwaway jab at Keats's attorney here is priceless. To continue his argument that I'm abusing the due process of this court, that I had no definite plan, etc., etc., etc. Keats, along with Cushing's maid, were plotting against Carla, and the judge and prosecutor think that. Marion Keats's testimony means the old angry mourner was the one who committed the murder. Mason, however, knows better. Who would kill a wolf? Not the Red Riding Hood. It would be the hunter, Sam Burris, who goes down. Now, Mr. Burris, would you explain to me and to the court just how it happened that when you went to investigate after Belle Adrian had left, that you saw a glass with lipstick on it when she'd already washed it and put it away? Well, I... You see, I mean, I was so shook up, you see. I don't recall too clear. But you do recall. You recall it because it's true. You did see a glass with lipstick on it. Because you were there before Belle Adrian. You were there before Marion Keith screamed. You were there when Mark Cushing was shot because you shot him. <laughs> In the epilogue, Mason assures Belle Adrian that he never doubted her innocence as she just wasn't the type though you could have fooled us with the strong arm routine he pulled in the court recess. Della chimes in with a meta commentary to say that the reason we know Belle Adrian isn't the type is because she's Perry's client. And who is the type, pray tell? Oh, that's easy, Paul. Anyone who is not represented by Perry Mason. <laughs> <laughs> she's been reading the scripts. The episode was based on the 1951 novel of the same name and is very true to the book. Plenty of lines of dialogue are lifted whole from Gardner's pages. Still, there are some differences. Like one, Cushing in the book is a skier, not a water skier. And this gets at where the novel 
actually takes place. It's clearly Northern California in the book, probably SoCal in the show. Number two, in the book, Cushing is the son of a rich tycoon who is so incensed at his son's death and so convinced of Bell's guilt that he pays for a special aid for Prosecutor Hale, which is crazy. Number three, the novel begins with Bell Adrian going over to the house, a scene we never directly see in the show. In the show, we begin with an alive Cushing. That's something we never see in the book. Number four, we also get some real talk about the pressures attending a young woman's maturation in the year of our Lord, 1951. It's all a bit um, awkward since we know it's coming from the mouth of old man Earl, but maybe it's me that finds it difficult to take when Gardner is lecturing us about the pressures attendant upon a 21-year-old woman. What's clear is that someone like, in the book, Carlotta, not Carla, has to deal with includes mashers like Cushing. Number five, we get a more detailed description of why someone like Sam Burris would have it in for Cushing. In the book, Burris sold Cushing land thinking that Cushing would use it for farming instead of for tourism. As farmland, Burris thought he built Cushing. Now that Cushing has rights to build hotels on it, real estate costs have driven Burris' taxes through the roof, and Burris has discovered that he signed his own financial death sentence. It's all about the cash, a very real concern about money in the present. Burris is worried he'll lose his home. Number six, Perry doesn't solve the case in court In private chambers, he essentially gives them the key clue that helps solve the crime, says, figure it out yourself, and walks out. It's pretty awesome. In our trivia subject each week, I'll give you three takeaways, a Paul, Adela, and a Perry. A Paul, remember, is a subject worth investigating more. Adela is something about a particular character or characters in the story. And finally, a Perry is something we learn about our main character. Our Paul this week concerns Paul himself. We get his telephone number. Oh, well, I'd like to speak to Paul Drake, the Drake Detective Agency in Los Angeles. The uh, telephone number is uh, try him at Crestview 97441. Does that give us any clue where in L.A. Paul might have lived? Indeed it does. Crestview is on the west side. Is that good? Is that bad? Is it indifferent? If you know anything about the Crestview neighborhood, drop me a line. Our Della this week concerns the prosecutor Hale and nameless judge in this Perry Goes Country episode. Hale is pretty on the ball, though the judge is a bit ducky. By all means, Mr. Mason, most assuredly the court didn't intend to foreclose a defendant. I simply assume that, uh, well, I... Won't commit myself in advance. Go right ahead with your defense. These characters and actors show up again in episode 45, The Case of the Buried Clock. There, the judge does get a name, Judge Norwood. So often, actors reappear, but with different names. Here, the same rural judge and prosecutor appear in a later episode. Our Perry this week concerns his patented charm with the ladies. The normally clip Perry here expounds on Marion Keats's reaction to him. In a word, she was uncooperative, antagonistic, very angry, and just wouldn't talk. I absolutely love it when Perry gets verbose, especially when he's the one who got rhetorically pummeled. He's so often the one giving the pummeling, and of course, by the time the episode's done, he's the one who's making the morning Keats even more angry than she already is. The theme of this week's episode is jealousy, the fear that someone else will take what belongs to you. This is what connects our title character, Marion Keats, to our actual murderer, Sam Burris. Keats fears she's lost Mark to Carla, while Burris fears he's lost his financial livelihood and reputation to Mark. It leads them both to a dark place. Lola Flory was jealous too murderously so. Mrs. Norwood in the case of the drowning duck? Natch. 
we might contrast the motive of jealousy with the motive of envy that we've seen in earlier murders like Lewis Bowles, who wanted away from his wife and the cash that Harry Merrill had that he wanted. Steve Harris, who wanted all the cash of his fiance, And Herbert Dean, who wanted the cash that his father-in-law had. Now, it's time for a Perry proverb. In this proverb, Perry details his ability to know his client was innocent. Were you surprised when you found I didn't do it? Of course not, Mrs. Adrian. I knew that all along. You just weren't the type. It's the eternal question, up there with, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Which is causal in this relationship? Perry's sense of his client's innocence, that is, he's so smart, he only chooses clients that he knows are innocent, or innocent clients who seek Perry out knowing he will faithfully defend them. That is, his clients are self-identifying. Guilty people don't even try to beat Perry's clients because they know he would turn them in if he discovered their truth. This is the conundrum of the Perry universe. And it's nice to hear him say, quite humbly, that there is a murdering type. It surely isn't the people he's defending. Before we go, let's head to the water cooler. You know, there is one thing I don't understand. Go on, Paul. Last week, my Paul from the trivia section concerned the stock that Mildred Kimber issued for Orchids Unlimited. I wondered aloud why she had even created the stock at all, since all it did was to functionally give Bob, her ineffectual husband, a chance to lose it in a game of chance. My father, being the financial whiz that he is, responded with some reasons why Mildred might make stock. One, it limits her liability, which would not be the case in a sole proprietorship or partnership. Two, it makes it easy to sell a portion of the business while retaining control. Three, it can make it easier to get financing by pledging stock as opposed to physical assets. Four, it can allow for expansion by the sale of additional shares of stock, which would raise capital. And five, this is my personal favorite, it makes it easier for estate planning, which, given Mildred's poor health, is a very real concern. I absolutely love these answers. Thanks so much, Dad. I'd love feedback about this particular episode of the podcast or the podcast in general. Was there something about this week's pod that you'd like to comment on? Something that you'd like to correct? You can leave comments on the pod's website at theperrypod.libsyn.com or email me at theperrypod at gmail.com. You'll find those links in the show notes. Thanks again for joining me on this pod journey. Next week we have, you guessed it, another two-timer, one Carver Clement, but he gets sent to the coroner upon receiving a crimson kiss. I hope you'll join me. Until next time, this is Jonathan Searcy saying, keep on walking that Park Avenue beat. Thank you.